Welcome to Red Eyes Radio. This is Henrik Palmgren from Sweden. Thank you for tuning in today. Please see our website, redeyescreations.com, for more radio shows. You also have redeyesradio.net. It goes uh, straight to our radio archive. Today we're talking with a former U.S. intelligence asset, Susan Lindauer, an uh, insider, a whistleblower who covered anti-terrorism at the Iraqi embassy in New York from 1996 up to the invasion in uh, 2003. She gave advance warning about the 9-11 attacks. She also started talks for the Lockerbie trial with uh, Libyan diplomats. Shortly after requesting to testify before Congress about successful elements of uh, pre-war intelligence, Lindauer became one of the first non-Arab Americans arrested on the uh, Patriot Act as an Iraqi agent. She was accused of warning her second cousin, White House Chief of Staff Andrew Card and Secretary of State Colin Powell, that war with Iraq would have catastrophic consequences. She was subjected to one year in prison at uh, Carlswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth, Texas, without a trial or hearing, and uh, threatened with indefinite detention, and also forcibly drugging to uh, basically shut her up. After five years of indictment without a conviction or a guilty plea, the Justice Department dismissed all charges five days before President Obama's inauguration. Well, today we're going to discuss the wars and the politics in the Middle East and the U.S. role in this. We'll also discuss the disastrous consequences that she did warn about now many years ago and what we've seen when it comes to ISIS more recently. We are also going to discuss 9-11 and everything connected with the disastrous policies of the neocons and those who pull their strings. Hi, Susan. Good to have you with us today. Thank you so much for talking with us. Hope you're doing well today. Great. Thank you very much for inviting me. You bet. I know you've told your story many times, and I'm uh, uh, you know, certain that some in our very informed audience here know about you already, but we do have newcomers uh, that come aboard all the time, so let's not assume that everyone you know, kind of knows your story, what you've gone through in the last few years, and what message you bring as an insider speaking out. So kind of, let, let's begin there. Maybe you can tell us about yourself, your story, and how it's tied to 9-11 and the rest there. Well, uh, my story is very relevant to what's happening today. I was the chief CIA asset covering Iraq at the United Nations and Libya at the United Nations as a back channel to the diplomatic missions and the ambassador staff um, for, for Iraq and Libya. And I covered them from 1995 right up until 2003. The story about Iraqi pre-war intelligence and 9-11 were completely falsified to the public. Um, My CIA handler lived next door to Colin Powell, who was the Secretary of State and former head of the Joint Chiefs, and I personally warned him in writing two times before his notorious speech at the United Nations, that the Iraqi exiles were fabricating intelligence on Iraq's weapons of mass destruction, that it was all a fraud. There were no WMDs. I insisted on this. I live in the suburbs of Washington, and I went down to Capitol Hill repeatedly for for about a year before the invasion, in plenty of time before the invasion, uh, to warn them that there that the that there would be horrific, catastrophic consequences to war, including what you're seeing now, with a regional conflict. I told them that the any puppet go, any government that they would install would be a puppet government, that it would have zero credibility and legitimacy with the Iraqi people, and that that there would have to be a purging of the corrupt, uh, untrustworthy Iraqi exiles, and that the Iraqi people would would band together to force them out. And this is what you're seeing right now in in truth with ISIL attracting a lot of support from the former Iraqi army and uh, Iraqi officers and uh, government of Saddam. There is, a, you know, a, the United States is portraying these people as being, um, uh, there, there are some hideous human beings. There are some Islamic jihadis there. 
Uh, but the coalition against the United States is much broader than what you're being told. They're focusing your attention on these horrific barbarian decapitations. And Lord knows I despise the types of people who would do that kind of thing in the name of God. That's an awful thing to do. But there's a lot more to this than the United States and the Western European governments are letting on because in fact these this the coalition ISIS has has become a coalition of uh, pro-Palestinian fighters. Uh, a lot of them have their eyes on 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 Israel. Uh, they are they are you they are already setting up launch points, um, scouting the Golan Heights, uh, and and the reason they're targeting Syria, I believe, has nothing to do with President Assad's um, uh, uh, politics. He is a very t- I know a lot of people hate him, but as a former CIA asset, I am telling you, the man is secular, stable, tolerant. He has balanced out all of of the needs of the different constituencies and communities, and he has refused, and most importantly, which is most interesting, is that he has refused to allow his country to be used, exploited against Israel. And that's why he needs to go. And that's why he needs, and that is what's so, but it's so, it, but it's it's kind of crazy that Washington has a lot of blowback right now because we do not understand who we are dealing with. The Saudis do not like Assad's government because the Saudis are Sunni and they oppose the Shiites. But the Hezbollah is portrayed as a, as a, uh, you know, Israel perhaps sees this as payback to Hezbollah for the 15 years of civil war in Lebanon. Um, and they are certainly powerful, passionate opponents of Israeli policy. However, you know, that is not to say that they are, that they are pro, uh, that, they, that it is a good idea for the United States to oppose them. So, yeah, yeah. Well, indeed, I definitely want to get into kind of the intricacies of, of ISIS later, American for, foreign yes. policy, who's running things, what, what's the, all the reasons behind this, basically. I, I, but- am, I am very critical, and most of, what, most of what I say to you, your listening audience will, 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 will challenge your listening audience at the beginning, but in time you will see that I am correct. And you will, if you start to wake, if you start to look past the labels, and this is the problem when we have foreign policy, all of our foreign of, the, of America's foreign policy, Western foreign policy, is based on this good guy, bad guy, all black, all white, and no 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 gradations of yeah. of, of truth. Um, and it's very it, it is it's 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 uh, uh, it's Manichaean sort of policy. Um, but we have uh, we and therefore we are surprised when it turns out that ISIL, for example, is being financed by the United States. We are the ones who have been training them. We are the ones who have given them weapons and money. We paid for those uniforms. And any money that did not come from us came from our allies in Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Um, when we, when Ambassador Stevens in Libya was shipping Libya's weapons to Turkey for the Syrian rebels, these are the people who were on the receiving end of the weapons, yep. of the shipments. And so it, it becomes, you know, uh, it, it is, it, we, ha- we need to face up to this right now, that it, our, our funding and our weapons shipments are going to the enemy, the people who we have declared to be the enemy. And the enemy is not so simplistic as we have said they are. They are a broader coalition of people, especially in Iraq, especially on that end of it. Uh, just like you have the anti-Assad fighters who are joining in Syria, inside Iraq you have a coalition of, of uh, Islamic jihadis tied in with the former Saddam National Guard, uh, National Republican Guard, excuse me, Republican Guard, former military officers who are determined to throw out the pro-Iranian influence. 
And so you have, you know, in, in Islam, as we know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right. And they have united together for this fight. And we are the, we, they, the Iraqi people see the United States as the bad guys. Yep. Okay. We are not the good guys. In, I mean, we see ISIL as being the bad guys. But inside Iraq, if you ask them who caused you the most trauma, they will tell you it's Blackwater and the mercenaries and up the, the, the guards at Abu Ghraib. This is payback. They, you know, they, they don't, they are throwing us out and, or we, they have thrown us out. Now they're throwing out the puppet government. This is what I told them was going to happen before the war. Yep. Well, exactly. It's, it's a lot of uh, interesting turns that have occurred here. And I think some are actually quite intentional, despite it. We don't see that in the, in the media and whatnot to kind of, uh, you know, harden the region and, and kind of uh, build this really uh the conflict zone basically but let's back up a little bit first and then we'll talk more about this later very interesting but tell us first how you were treated by uh, uh the american government when you started talking out about this you were incarcerated for a while and all that kind of stuff uh just tell us what what happened there yes um the reason that the american people and the global community do not know the, the facts of Iraqi pre-war intelligence and and 9/11. You don't know any. I mean, no, not not you, not you, <laughs> Henrik, but uh, <laughs> but but the but the but your audience, the people, sure. the, the all ordinary people should know this story. They should know what happened, but they don't because uh, I had uh, and and in terms of uh, I want you to all to think about Edward Snowden for a minute and think about Julian Assange and think about Bradley Manning. Senator Dianne Feinstein has made a, a defense of Washington's treatment of Edward Snowden by saying, and, and Bradley Manning, saying that if they had any uh, warnings to share, if they had seen, if they had witnessed any abuses in Iraq or any abuses in the surveillance protocols, they sh there was a proper way to handle it, which was to go directly to Congress and bring their petitions and their grievances to Congress, and they and Congress would have would have dealt with it. Well, I did that. Uh, I I went to I requested to testify when George Bush announced that there was going to be presidential commission on Iraqi pre-war intelligence. I requested to testify, and uh, thirty days later, I awoke to hear the FBI pounding on my door, and I became I was when I opened the door, I was uh, arrested on the Patriot Act as an accused Iraqi agent. Mm. George Bush declared that if I was not with his policy, not supporting his war in Iraq, that I must be a foreign agent and I should, and the, and the charge was serious, uh, that I would spend 35 years in federal prison. Well, yeah. uh, but because it was on the Patriot Act, I was subjected to secret charges, secret evidence, secret grand jury testimony. The government was never required to provide a single shred of evidence that I broke the law at all. They were just supposed to, the, 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 the court was just supposed to take it on faith that there must be some evidence that was so classified, so confidential that the government could not bear to produce it because it would damage national security. Well, that's a lovely argument until you realize there was no evidence against me. And to put this in context, if someone robs a bank, the government is required to tell you which bank it was. What was the address of this bank? They're required to produce evidence that the bank was actually robbed. Uh, they're, they're required to say, yes, uh, on Monday, October 2nd, uh, $50,000 was robbed from the, the Bank of America branch on University Boulevard at 11 o'clock in the morning. The getaway car was a, a black sedan with license plates number you know, yep. and, and, and they're required to show that the crime occurred under the Patriot Act and under a very nebulous charge like acting as a foreign agent. There's no, it's just such a, it's, it's like a, how do you, how do you prove a negative? Right. It's very much a personal, 
Uh, it's just a personal slander of someone. And the government knew it. So I, after uh, I, I was freed on bail for a year and a half, uh, and then the court decided, Congress decided that the, two things happened. Congress decided that uh, they would, the, the Democrats in Congress decided that they would conduct an investigation as to whether the GOP was punishing intelligence staff and foreign policy staff who had criticized the president and who had criticized the Iraqi policy. And if they were using criminal prosecutions for that purpose, immediately. And the second thing was, was that Colin Powell uh, launched a book tour to whitewash the blood and guts off his reputation. And he declared that he had, that no one at the mid-level of the intelligence community had given him any advance warning before his speech at the United Nations that the intelligence was bad, that it was fabricated intelligence, and that it was completely untrustworthy. Well, the problem for his story, the problem for his alibi, was that I had done exactly that. I had gone to him. I did warn him it was bad intelligence. I was the chief asset covering Iraq at the United Nations for seven or eight years by that point. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, you, you, and I outlined all of the consequences. I ran the, the rise of Iran, the rise of charismatic leaders uh, who would become, you know, terrorist, who, who would become, t quote, terrorist personalities fighting the occupation. The, uh, the fact that it would be considered traitorous for any Iraqi to support the occupation, which would make it impossible to run the country because they would consider it treasonous uh, to, to put America's interests before their own. And I said, finally, you know, the puppet government, whatever puppet government you install, you know, the, the Iraq will be, will be composed of Iraqi exiles who have no constituent support in the country. And at whatever point the United States leaves Iraq, the Iraqi people will turn on those people on the, uh, in, in a very short time. The Iraqi people will turn on the, the puppet government and will, there will be a new war, a new war to oust that, that, that government and that puppet government. And I said, it is inevitable. It is going to be part of their national healing process. There will have to be another war. And I said, God help you if it becomes a regional war that draws in the Kurds, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that draws in the Kurds from Iran and Turkey and Syria. <laughs> yeah. And I said, you're, in, you're going to be in so much trouble because this will become a region. This has great risks of becoming a part two region wide conflagration. And I was right. I was right. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. Now, of course, the the question there is: Is this what they wanted? Is, is there any no, suggestions here that they wanted they to? Not, they had. They were so arrogant. It was the hubris of Washington to believe that we could dictate to the little brown people, and the little brown people would be so grateful that we were bringing them freedom and democracy, and that we got rid of Saddam Hussein. They would not care that we stole their oil. We wouldn't. They would. They would be over. They would be bowed over by our, super, our natural American exceptionalism and our, they would want to buy our consumer goods. Well, of course, this is completely garbage. I mean, we, we're not, we don't have any, we don't, we don't produce any consumer goods anymore. We don't, we're not exceptional people. Our behavior was abhorrent and repulsive and repugnant. Uh, the abuses that we inflicted on the Iraqi people are unforgivable. It was war crimes. Before the war ever started, uh, the, the United Nations sanctions killed between 1.7 million people and 2.2 million human beings. The, the figure of 500,000 dead children is incomplete. It was 500,000 dead children by 1996, but the sanctions continued for another seven years. So what ended up, I kept tallies of all this stuff. 
and uh, all, all these these figures in real time. And it turned out to be more like a million dead children under the age of five because the United Nations refused to count six-year-olds and seven-year-olds. It is You don't kill someone's children and expect them ever to forgive you. Mm-hmm. Um, this yep. is it. This is just. This is a. This was. It was an outrage, and and the the, the foreign uh, policy journal, foreign affairs journal, wrote that uh, accurately that United Nations sanctions against Iraq were the only weapons of mass destruction in that country, and that United Nations sanctions had killed more than all the WMDs ever used in all of history combined. And I have to tell you that I was amazed that, that, that a conservative journal like that would dare to be so bold. But they were accurate. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is that what you're seeing today must be viewed in the context of the, of the old history. Because it is for every action in politics, there is a reaction. And this is what we're getting now. And the danger is that the shock and awe bombing will further alienate the Iraqi people. You, you, I'm sure you will ki- that we, the Washington will kill some ISIS fighters. And I'm sure that the Kurdish people will be very grateful to the United States and the Saudis and the Qatari, pe- the Qatari people, uh, the, the Emirates fighters. And certainly the ISIL fighters are demonic. They are barbarians. It is, it is so grotesque what they're doing. I agree. They're the bad guys. The problem is we created them. They're using weapons that we gave them. They're using training that we taught them. You know, we, they're using ammunition that we purchased. Yep. So if it wasn't the intention to, to cause conflict and, and, and exacerbate, uh, you know, the co- conflict in the greater Middle East in this way, uh, why give them all the weaponry and all that kind of stuff then? Yes. Oh, it's just, it, we, it is, it is, it is hubris and stupidity that we think we're in control. We, we imagine Washington imagines that they will do, that we will dictate the terms and, and they will fall into line where we tell them to go. It, it it is it is it is the greatest fallacy. Huh. I got. I, I don't know. There's some part of me that thinks, okay, maybe that's the official line. But certainly, if we look at, you know, who's pulling this, because you mentioned before, you know, that America is viewed as the bad guy now, understandably. And I wonder, of course, if let's say the people of Iraq realize that this is not what the American people want. I mean, who's pulling the strings here? We have a- APAC, American foreign policy is completely run by by f- foreign interests. You know. Absolutely, but it doesn't matter. It's just like uh, the the American people <laughs> uh, are collateral damage of the American policy, just like the Iraqi people are collateral damage of the, exactly. of the bombing yeah. campaigns. We are the collateral damage. Oh, they don't care if we support our government. It no longer matters if every single American. It's just like under. It, it's just every rule that you applied to Saddam Hussein applies to us. It does. It did not matter to Madeleine Albright that every Iraqi citizen might be opposed to the Iraqi government. They didn't care. They were going to slaughter them all anyway. And it does not matter to the Iraqi people today that every single American that might that not every single American, but intelligent thinking Americans might oppose what Barack Obama is doing because we are the bad guys and it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. That 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 Europe that European people might oppose this policy. If the European governments are doing it, I guarantee the war is coming for us, and it is going to come for us. It's going to come. It's not going to be contained. This war will not be contained in the Middle East. It will not. You know, every bomb that we drop, they will feel they're entitled to drop another bomb. Uh, against well, it's, us. It, it's already spreading to other parts of the world. Look at Europe now. There's been, you know, several yes. clashes be, between ISIS forces. I mean, in Germany, their police there have to break up fights between, you know, pro and, and against ISIL forces and all that kind of stuff. And it's like blooming out in all different parts of the world now. Yeah. That is not making it into the corporate media of the United States, I can tell you. Sure, of course. Yeah. 
Yeah, that now, is not. And tell us about Israel's ro role in this then in terms of pulling the strings here and, and getting America into these kinds of war. APAC is a very strong force within American politics and every president, of course, has to be very lovey-dovey with, with APAC and, and, and Israel's lobbies and everything else. What's their stake in this? Uh, is, all of these wars have been fought for Israel. Um, I call a Congress Israel's armchair warriors in Washington. They are, uh, they, they, do, they don't, the, the Pentagon, uh, General Martin Dempsey, who is the head of the Joint Chiefs in Washington, has been, been a superior and outspoken opponent of war in Iran and has been very aggressive about stopping it. He just said, we, we refuse to fight this. We'd refuse to do this, and he has called out Israel as the as the primary uh, provocateur. The problem is that Israel has been has then become more subtle about how they go about this. They've been pushing very hard to go after Hezbollah in Lebanon and against President Assad, which is stupid. It's just incredibly stupid because. President Assad is the one person, the one force of government that stops the Israeli, the excuse me, the the Islamic jihadis from overrunning Israel at this very moment. Um, during the Lebanese civil war that involved a, a, a cross war with Israel between Lebanon and Israel, the CIA did a study that if all the Arabs united together. The, all the Arabs together could defeat Israel and knock it off the map in a 10-year war. Well, ISIL has got hold of that information. And ISIL is now saying that they can do this, do the same job in 72 months. And I happen to know that they're going around the 20 uh, Palestinian refugee camps in Syria and Lebanon and Jordan. And these are hundreds of thousands of disenchantized, disenfranchised people who have no jobs, no houses, no future, nothing. And ISIL is recruiting them, promising that if they get on board right now, that they will, as soon as they take out Assad, they will turn on Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. And they will have a major war and a major push to take out Israel. Well, so Israel has really, you know, has really, uh, Israel is becoming more dependent than ever on the United States because Israel alone has no chance of defeating those people. Um, they will, they can put up a fight at the start. Even with and all I'm their sure nukes their and everything cloud, that they have? <laughs> their, their cloud, like they showed in Gaza during the Ramadan war, if, if it was only the, the Palestinian fighters, they can win. But once it's once it's coming from all sources, then you're going to see that Israel has you're all of a sudden it's going to be manifest that Israel and Saudi Arabia are longtime friends and Israel and Qatar are longtime friends. And Israel has been backing the monarchy against the jihadists. Saudi Arabia, other than Washington, Saudi Arabia is the largest uh, financier of this of these terrorists. Um terrorist camps mm -hmm. let me ask you this uh, i mean a, a swedish independent uh, nuclear uh i don't know what to call it body or whatnot but they anyway they came to a they, they were looking into the the question regarding israel's uh you know nuclear weapons and all that as we know the new news spoke out about that many years ago now but they estimated that they had around 80 nuclear weapons at their disposal and we know something about you know, for example, the Samson option, yeah, more than that. you know, which is, I wouldn't doubt it. The Samson option uh, entails basically that if, if we end up in any kind of scenario where we would be threatened, we would just, you know, kind of scorch the earth kind of thing. Um, and that's a viable option, I think, in this case, if a real threat were to be posed against them. What's the what's the likelihood of this? Do you think in terms of? Uh, uh, well, I, I think the Samson option even goes farther because they they sort of imply with the Samson option that they would access U.S. military nuclear weapons from U.S. bases and that they might even have some of the U.S. launch codes. <laughs> it's just insane. I, I've yeah. heard, I've oh, heard man. this before. I've heard this before uh, going back uh, going back 
a good number of years that Israel would use U.S. weapons and that Israel could unlock, had the capacity to unlock those weapons on its own and override the United States. Yeah. So if, if we, even if we, the United States said we don't want our weapons to be used, Israel has the capacity to access our military complexes and to launch our nuclear weapons. That's what I've been told. And I've been told that not by conspiracy theorists, but by defense intelligence people who are outraged over it, who, who are very, who are grievously worried that it will, uh, that it will happen, that that's exactly what they'll do. I mean, that's just, if something like that would occur, I'd, I'd, I'd imagine and I hope that there would be a tremendous rift within the American military and leadership as well, but because a lot of the problems now is from the staunch pro-Zionist American politicians and military people and everything else that are playing right into the hands of Israel, right? Yes, yes. And the members of Con most people do not know, members of Congress are required by APAC, the American-Israeli Political Action Committee. The APAC require is the most is the biggest lobby in Washington, and requires Congress uh, to sign a pledge in exchange for fundraising for campaign fundraising. And all of these elections require huge quantities of money. They just burn money like nobody you've ever seen burn money for nothing. Everybody, all the American people are so unhappy with this system, but there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, and they, Israel, requ APAC requires that they, that members of Congress using their money sign pledges that they will never cut Israel's funding allowance. Yeah. That they recognize that Jerusalem is the is the God given capital of Israel, and that they will do everything in their everything necessary to protect Israel's right to exist on the earth. And if if a Congress member refuses to sign that document, then that pledge, then their funding is Mister is is almost immediately pulled off. And when they do campaign fundraising, the people say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to call you, I'm not allowed to help you, I'm not allowed to give you anything because you haven't signed the pledge. I can't host an event for you because you didn't sign the pledge <laughs> to Israel. Mm -hmm. And so they, they're buying our politicians that way. Well, definitely. It's a really sad situation. Now, uh, let's keep all these things in mind here as we discuss further in terms of um, you know, how you see the geopolitical uh, chessboard, if you will, kind of play out here. But I wanted to back up and just ask you about the larger question here I, in terms of if all these activities we see uh, are actually hinged on a lie, th this house of cards would actually come crumbling down pretty quick, which is, of course, why they cover up so many different things. Uh, and at the same time, the more of these kinds of events that occur, the more radicalized, you know, Middle East gets and the conflict ramps up, the less time people have as well to kind of look into the background of these things. They're just, you know, struggling to keep yes. up with what's going on. Right. But in terms of the September 11 attacks, I, I say personally that has kind of three main components or question to it and is who, who was behind the execution of it, who planned it and, and who let the guard down to allow it to happen. Uh, how do you stand on these three questions, Susan? These are very important questions. Um, first of all, uh, and again, this should be this should be uh, part of the history of the pre-war period, because 9/11 has has been the the, the call to arms that, that has been the justification for these stupid mistakes in foreign policy, these horrible, horrible wars that have been conducted, they've all been launched because of this phony story invented about 9-11. I, so, so let me tell you what really happened um, in the months before 9-11. I, I have direct knowledge of this. Uh, I, I first learned about the 9-11 attack in April and May of 2001. In April of 2001, I received a summon to my CIA handler's office. He told me that the United States was demanding that Iraq hand over any fragment of intelligence involving airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center. He said that we, we uh, that, that if Iraq, that it had been decided at the highest levels of government that if Iraq possessed that information and refused to hand it over to the United States, 
or fail to do so, then the United States would, de would declare that an act of war and the United States would bomb Iraq harder than they'd ever been bombed before back to the Stone Age. Uh, and that, they, that they, there would be a whole new conflagration war against Iraq. Um, now, at that point, the Iraqi diplomats responded that they were chagrined. They were, they were, uh, they were, they, they said that uh, they did not possess any intelligence, but they would be willing to have the FBI. Now, this is in April and May of 2001. Iraq said they would be willing to have the FBI send a terrorism task force into the country with authorization to conduct terrorism interviews, interview suspects, um, interview witnesses, um, and to make arrests if required. And this was, uh, this was something that, uh, so, so they already, they, Iraq had been one of our best supporters of anti-terrorism in the Middle East, all throughout Saddam Hussein's government, through his reign, his rule. Uh, Saddam recognized that this was one point that he could share with the West, and he was even more anti-terrorist than Dick Cheney. Uh, he believed that any jihadi, any young man who was a conservative fundamentalist, would eventually get to a point where he would become a terrorist, because of the, and that they would that they would be at risk of trying to destate take advantage of the sanctions and the poverty in order to destabilize the country and so uh, Saddam's government uh, wanted to was, was in a tight bind because uh, they wanted to keep those people under control but they were under pressure not to make political arrests so it was much better to cooperate with Washington and then and you know, and point out where these people were, and then the United States could arrest them. And so Saddam really played, you know, really recognized that uh, that 9/11 was his ace in the hole. Um, and so they were very confident. And and throughout the summer of 2001, repeatedly, I asked Iraq, I demanded that Iraq must give us intelligence on this conspiracy. And Iraq repeatedly told me that Washington was the source of the intelligence. Mm. That all that they were chasing it down, and everything came back to us. And they said, "You, you know, the, the the conspiracy is the the talk of the conspiracy comes originates with you. You know more about this than anybody. You are involved in this somehow." And and uh, that, that's uh, so. so, did, so you, did you after, speak out uh, as soon as you learned this? I mean, because obviously this is a few months here before the attacks. What 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 did you do at that point when you had this knowledge? Well, at at that point, uh, I I was uh, uh, at that point there was a lot of buzz throughout the summer of two thousand one. There was a great deal of buzz on the intelligence side. Uh, a lot of talk about the attack. I. I, I warned friends, apparently, that uh, who testified in court. This was actually confirmed at my at the the one. I was only allowed one court hearing, um, one court hearing uh, in five years of indictment on the Patriot Act, and it was confirmed that I told friends the attack would happen at the end of August or early September. And that in August, I said the attack was imminent, and I told them to stay out of New York City because we expected that there would be airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center, and the possible a possible thermonuclear device that would bring down the towers. Always, we talked about the explosives until 9/11. Until it actually happened, the the, the official story of 9/11 always carried a component of explosives that would destroy the tower it was the towers it was only after 9/11 that the story was they tried to reinvent that the scenario as it was being portrayed to the public but we knew about it and I do not believe that it was a foreign uh, excuse me that it was a, a, a Saudi conspiracy I believe I do believe that the United States 
that Mohammed Atta and the um, hija other hi the 19 hijackers were CIA assets, and they were being trained and recruited and trained how to fl fly the planes, recruited, paid, um, and set up for the conspiracy. There's even some question as to whether they were ever there at all or whether they just were, were ordered to leave the country so that they would go into hiding right at that point. This is, this is, there, there is evidence, strong evidence, that this was a, a drone flight. And this shocks people because it's hard for people not to realize that there was, that there may not have ever been any hijackings at all. If there were hijackings, then it was done by a CIA trained team. And it was a setup. It was a PSYOP. But those people all lived. They, it's all, it's, isn't it a magic that they crashed into the World Trade Center towers and then they walked away and they went back to Saudi Arabia? Okay? Seven of the hijackers have been identified after the attack. Yeah. Seven of the 19. And I believe that it was, I support architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. It was a controlled demolition. Uh, that brought down the towers. It was it was some combination, uh, I believe, of thermonitrate bombs, and underneath in the girders of the building in the basement, I believe it was a a, a small miniature thermonuclear device that was planted underneath the buildings, and we know this is consistent with the science. The dust particles showed therm a thermonuclear a thermonitrate. Uh, a thermonitrate explosion that melted, that was powerful enough to melt the steel into dust and to transform it into dust instantaneously. And then the, the un, under the building, people don't know that in the basement, the sub-basement level, the fires burned of, uh, uh, st fires of steel burned until December. It burned for four months. Yep. And 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 that's because this was not this was not a jet fuel fire. That's the silliest thing I've ever heard. I mean that talks you have to suspend disbelief so so badly for that. That's just ridiculous. That's a that's a that's a 5-year-old could be a 5-year-old should not be fooled by this story. Let alone an adult. Wake up. <laughs> it did not happen the way they said it did. No, well, well that's just it. I mean, uh, certainly we can argue about the the method of execution of this, exactly. but no, but nonetheless, the official story that is the con that's the conspiracy, you know. So yes, what type of bomb? You have to look at the science, and I and always, you know, always look at the science. Architects and engineers for nine eleven truth has done some excellent work on that. Um, I do believe there were airplanes. I believe there was a, you know, there, there's physical evidence that there was some type of airplane used. Um, whether it was a real, witnesses who were there have said that it was not, um, uh, that, the, 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 that the videos may have been photoshopped with the um, American Airlines logos and painting because the people who were actually on the ground who saw it one on face up you know face to face who came face to face with this um have, have said it was a gray airplane with no color and no markings no logos and there were no windows on the side of the plane at all and there was only a, a cockpit at the front and one of the witnesses has said that, or a couple of witnesses who were who were at eye level of the building from like a, a, a building across the way, you know, with because New York, as you know, is so tightly compacted together. But someone who was at the same level of, you know, at the same, uh, you know, who, who could see in has see, has said that they that they were at a high up they were at a high up floor in a different building that but but had a bird's eye view into that of that airplane and said that there was no pilot at all in the cockpit there was no flight crew the plane was not traveling 500 miles an hour it was traveling about 175 to 200 miles an hour and the and the wings were were tipping back and forth weaving up and down uh, there, as if it was very difficult to control the airplane. 
Um, and it did a 180 degree turn. Apparently, it did not. It did not hit straight on. Uh, it came and circled, and came back. Circled, circled back, and and made a U turn, and came back to hit the towers. So it, it it's it's very it's very suspicious. Well, it, it certainly is. And, and Susan, we're going to take a break here in a little bit, but I wanted to squeeze in one more uh, question here as well. And it has to do what happened with the, the judges and all that kind of stuff. The government, I think, dropped your prosecution in uh, 2009. But before that, and I want to ask you why you believe this happened here, because if it was related to some of the material you presented or whatnot, but uh, I think the judge ruled you mentally unfit to stand trial. Yes. What, what, what happened there? Tell us yes. about that. Uh, th- that's a good question for after the break. Okay, it's a longer one. I understand. No problem about that. Yeah, let, let's let's have that as a, let's have that after the break. Okay, no problem. Tell me uh, if you have any websites that you want to give out. Have you written anything on this books? Do you have any material available? Yes, uh, I I urge everyone to to get the complete story of Iraqi pre war intelligence and the nine eleven warnings. Uh, I urge everyone to read my book Extreme Prejudice. It's available at Amazon on Kindle. Uh, and you can get it in paperback and ebook. All right, very good. We'll link up to Amazon there. Extreme Prejudice will have that uh, linked up. But uh, yeah, okay, very good. Much more to ask you about here, Susan. So stay with us. We'll take a short break and then we'll be right back. And as we continue in the second hour, we begin to discuss how her prosecution was dropped in 2009 and the judge deemed her mentally unfit to uh, stand trial. We are going to get into what this was about. We'll proceed to discuss the Yinian plan for a greater Israel and how the wars in Syria, Iraq and the response from ISIS plays into this agenda. We discuss the Zionist plan for the Middle East and APAC control of American foreign policy and how the neocons, the New York intellectuals, are using America with no consideration for what is good for America. Traitors with, in some cases, dual citizenships. We end on the question of Russia and how they play into this equation and where things will go from here. Please stay with us. Much more is coming up. Subscribe at redicemembers.com and download or stream any of our previous programs. We have a lot of shows there for you, close to 900 on a broad array of different subjects that we have been investigating and finding out more about. If you're on an iPhone or iPad, please see our instructions on redicemembers.com for how to subscribe to the members' feeds using a podcast app This is uh, specifically for you guys and gals on iOS 8. The latest release from Apple has been giving us some uh, hiccups here. But we're working on resolving this right now. But uh, do use a podcast app to download and play from your device. Uh, This way you can play the program when you're offline as well. Uh, We have Dennis Fetcho, Tim Murdoch and Veronica Clark with us next. And then later on ahead we also have John DeNugent, Matthew Tate, Tracy Twyman and Laird Scranton and many more as well. Well, thank you for listening. We'll pick this up right after the break on redicememembers.com.